Frankie Munoz will run full-time in NASCAR in 2025. Dale Jr. will run the Budweiser number 8 card select races in 2024 and 2025. And Chandler Smith's future at Joe Gibbs Racing is certainly in question currently at the moment. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We got some NASCAR and other motorsports story discusser today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just show them channels really quickly. We're first going to take a look at a ton of pain seams that have been revealed over the course of the last couple days. Let's go ahead and just show them straight into them. The first paint scheme we're taking a look at is AJ Allmendinger's 2024 Wool Ride Express scheme that we'll see this weekend at home at Miami Speedway. This is certainly a Ty Norris sponsorship. This looks absolutely incredible. I think the colleague did a very solid job. It looks pretty good. I think they did a really nice job on it, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing on the racetrack this weekend at Homestead. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Ricky Stenhouse Jr.'s 2024 Kroger Vitamin Water Scheme that we'll see this weekend at Homestead. This is one of the better JTG Doherty sponsorships I've seen so far. I like the purple. I think the colors look really solid on it for sure. It, very, it looks very minimalistic, but it does look solid also in my opinion. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Daniel Suarez's 2024 Freeway Insurance Scheme that we'll see this weekend at Homestead Miami Speedway. It's very hard to see it, but there's definitely some different look to it this weekend. They kind of change it up. Obviously, they're trying to change up the colors with them being going to Miami. You kind of want those brighter colors especially. It does look pretty good, though. Looking forward to seeing the racetrack this weekend at Homestead. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Spencer Boy's 2024 Tentacle Scheme that we'll see, I believe, this weekend at Homestead Miami Speedway. Schemes are right in my opinion i think they've done an okay job on their schemes in the past this wasn't the best one they've done so far it's okay looking forward to seeing on the racetrack this weekend at home set next paint scheme we're taking a look at is tyler reddick's 2024 beast unleashed scheme that we'll see this weekend at home set this has got a different look to it usually when you see the beast unleashed scheme you see in the green colors they're running an orange brown collar this weekend and it looks really great in my opinion 2311 has gotten so much better with their paint schemes it does look pretty awesome the next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Josh Berry's 2024 Panini America scheme that we'll see this weekend at Homestead. This looks incredible. The colors are bright. They absolutely pop in your face. It looks absolutely amazing. Definitely looking forward to seeing on the racetrack this weekend at Homestead. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Brendan Poole's 2024 Mac Door scheme that we'll see this weekend at Homestead. I do like the orange and I do like the black on it. I think it does look pretty all right. Looking forward to seeing on the racetrack at Homestead. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Daniel Dye's 2024 Giuseppe Steel City Pizza Scheme that we'll see, I believe, this weekend at Homestead. Scheme looks pretty good, in my opinion. Do like the colors on it. It's kind of simplistic as well, but it does look a little bit creative, in my honest opinion. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Cole Custer's 2024 World WWE NXT Scheme that we'll see this weekend at Homestead. This is a massive partnership as a whole. It looks absolutely fabulous. It looks incredible. Cole Custer was on WWE this past lot, a couple days. This car looks awesome. Looking forward to seeing the racetrack and Homestead. And a final paint scheme we're taking a look at is Ross Chastain's 2024 Kubota scheme that we'll see this weekend at Homestead. There's definitely some differences with this scheme for sure. If you take a look at it, usually you see a black number on the car. It's actually got a white number, and there's definitely some design changes on the car for sure. Personally, I think this is a car they should use in my opinion. I do think it looks really, really solid. I'm definitely looking forward to see on the racetrack for sure this weekend at Homestead. And now we're going to head jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Martin Truex Jr. As it was announced earlier today that Martin Truex Jr. is going to be running a throwback scheme this week in the Homestead Miami Speedway to his 2017 championship scheme when he won in Homestead to win his first NASCAR Cup Series championship. This course is a tribute scheme to Martin Truex Jr. Of course, Martin Truex Jr. will retire from full-time NASCAR Cup racing in a couple weeks from now after Phoenix concludes, though he will run part-time most likely with 2311 next year. I love this. I'm really glad to see that Joe Gibbs is doing some sort of partnership for Martin Truex Jr. to close out the year. Truex is going out, and I think he deserves a lot of recognition and praise for what he's done. He's one of the most underrated drivers ever in NASCAR Cup history, and to see what he's done for the sport over the years is phenomenal and incredible. He said he'll retire from full-time racing, but I think that Joe Gibbs Racing absolutely nailed this and knocked this one out of the park. It looks absolutely fabulous. It's a great tribute scheme, in my opinion, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing on the racetrack at Homestead this weekend. It looks absolutely amazing.
And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Norm Benning. As it was reported by Brock Beard that Norm Benning is planning to run Martinsville and potentially Daytona next year in 2025. He'll run Martinsville with an old KHI car, of course, Kevin Harvick Incorporated truck that ran in the truck series from, I believe, the 2000s up until the 2011 season. For Kevin Harvick sold this team, I believe, to Joe Dinette in 2012. Norm Benning coming back and racing a few more races is honestly really amazing to see. Norm did race in the Truck Series race most recently at Talladega and had a really solid performance. It actually had his best finish in a long time and I believe holds the record for the oldest finishing position in a truck or NASCAR race as a whole on the lead lap and continues to hold that record. Norm did a really, really great job and it's good to see that Norm is continuing to look for sponsorship so he can run more races in the future. This is really amazing to see nonetheless for sure and glad to see that Norm Benning is going to be able to run some more races going into the not-so-distance future, including Homestead, Martinsville, excuse me, and not too far down the road at a track like Daytona. And now we're going to hedge up onto the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Mason Maggio. As it was announced yesterday that Mason Maggio will drive the 45 for Alpha Prime Racing this weekend at home San Miami Speedway. Mason Maggio is, I believe, only 19 or 20 years old, but has been kind of impressive in his select starts in the lower series. I think Mason is getting the best opportunity he's had in his NASCAR career up to this point. While Alf Prime Racing is not the fastest organization in the world, this team has shown some stuff this year. They've had top 20 speed in the beginning of the year. The 45 cars look really good to make it in on owner's points, so they are not televising practice qualifying for whatever reason. But I do think it's a really great opportunity for Mason. I could see Mason getting a top 25 at least, and maybe even having a shot at top 20. I've seen him do really good stuff in underfunded equipment. I think he's going to have a really good chance and opportunity, and maybe just maybe he might be the driver replacing Ryan Ellis. He might be getting his chance here because you never know if he does well enough, this could lead potentially to Mason Maggio driving full-time for Alp Prime Racing in the NASCAR Xfinity Series next year in 2025. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Brad Perez. As it was announced yesterday that Brad Perez will drive the 07 for SS Greenlight Racing this weekend at home San Miami Speedway. Brad Perez has made select starts in the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series over the years, including racing at this track last year, where I believe he qualified around 20th to 25th, and also Rez ran some select Xfinity Series races, including driving a 45 car a couple weekends ago at Kansas Speedway, where unfortunately spun out during and qualifying. Brad is someone who's been working at really getting opportunities. He's one of the hardest working people in this garage and like I said, has been working to try to get opportunities to race in this sport. I love that he's getting a chance with SS Greenlight Racing. We know they're not the fastest organization in the world, but I do think getting a chance with this type of organization to build up your career can lead to a lot of success down the road and maybe going forward into the future. I think he does have a lot of potential. I think he does have some talent nonetheless. I think it's an amazing opportunity for Brad. The car also looks good that they're going to be running. I think it's, again, it's such a great opportunity for him, and I'm looking forward to see what he can do for sure this weekend in the 07 car at home said Miami Speedway. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Dawson Cramp. As it was announced and reported earlier today that Dawson Cramp will drive a 74 for Mike Harmon Racing this weekend at home said Miami Speedway. Dawson Cram has made select starts in the NASCAR Xfinity Series so far in 2024, where he's ran up front in certain instances, but also has had some decent qualifying runs. Now, Mike Harmon Racing had a really good run this past weekend at the race at Las Vegas, where they qualified, I believe, around 30th position and legit had top 35 speed early in the event which is going to help them qualify in their way into races going forward. And Dawson has made quite a few starts for Mike Harmon Racing in the past. You go back to 2022 and 2023. Dawson's qualified for this team, and i got to say, him driving this car is going to be really good. He's familiar with this organization. He's familiar with this team. And I do believe that Dawson Cram is going to be able to get the best out of that car, where I think he's got another good chance to maybe qualify inside the top 30 and maybe could also run up front for sure. Again, a really great opportunity for Dawson. I expect some really good things from him going into this weekend. I think he will qualify his way into the event for sure if he's not already locked in. I think he'll be very fast and pretty solid for sure this weekend at home set Miami Speedway. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Josh Balicki. As it was announced earlier this afternoon that Josh Balicki will drive the 92 for DGM Racing and two weeks from now at Phoenix International Raceway. 
Josh Blake is making select starts with DGM Racing so far in 2024, along with racing a few select races with Joe Gibbs Racing in the NASCAR Cine Series, where of course he did lead a ton of laps at the Charlotte Robo and ran up front in a good portion of that event. He's also made other starts in the Cup Series this year with MBM Motorsports and has had some decent runs with this organization this year. Josh Blake is someone who can always get the best out of equipment, and I do think he is someone who could have a really strong run, though DGM Racing has been a little up and down throughout the 2024 Xfinity Series campaign. We don't know what Josh Blake is currently doing for 2025, but if I'm a team looking for a drive for next year, Josh Blake should be a guy that an organization is looking at for going into next year. I expect Josh Blake to have a really solid performance. I think a top 25 is certainly possible for sure. He can sometimes, like I said, get the best out of equipment. I think he will for sure have a chance and opportunity to at least get maybe, just maybe, a top 25 with this organization this weekend, or in a couple weekends from now, at Phoenix International Raceway. And now we're going to head jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Team Amravent. As it was reported earlier this evening, an article today wrote that Team Amravent is looking to plan to run 15 to 17 NASCAR Cup Series races in 2025. In the article, they did not reveal a driver. I think it's to be determined or to be announced at this point. Now, for those who do not know who Team Amravent is, Team Amravent is a former money team. It's unknown at this point, but there's been some speculation recently that Floyd Mayweather is no longer part of this organization owning it. Floyd Mayweather had an ownership stake in this organization. This is also the former Starcom Racing guys who had a partnership with Derek Cobb from, I believe, 2017 or 2018 up until the end of 2021 when Starcom Racing left the sport at the end of that year. Team Amravent, like I said, is being very ambitious. Now, we don't know who the driver is currently at the moment. I do think there's probably going to be someone that isn't signed for next year. Maybe they go after someone like a Matt Benedetto for select start. So I do think he's going to be driving for Viking Motorsports next year in the Xfinity Series. It could be someone else that we don't know. Maybe someone, for instance, like Daniel Hemrick. Daniel Hemrick doesn't have anything lined up currently at the moment for 2024 or 25. He could definitely be a driver they could go after to put behind the wheel. But I also have to imagine they're beginning some stuff from ECR. That I believe the ECR has been leasing out some engines to that organization, and they've been using that to make other starts this year. Of course, they ran the Coke 600, and they were looking to run the Daytona 500, but they ran out of a lot of money. Nonetheless, I'm glad to see this organization will be showing up in more races in 2025. My best guess is they're probably not going to run that many races. I think they'll probably run about 5 to 10. They'll probably run some of the bigger races like the Daytona 500, probably the Coke 600, probably the Southern 500, maybe the championship race as well, and maybe just maybe down the road they could find a way to acquire a charter in the near future if more charters do become available and they can become a team that can become powerful, though I'm not really expecting that from Team Amravet going into the not-so-distance future. And now we're going to head jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Nice Motorsports. As it was announced yesterday, Nice Motorsports is making some crew chief changes for the remainder of 2024. Mike Schipp will move away from Brett Holmes Racing and will crew chief for the number 42 truck for Nice Motorsports or Matt Mills for the remainder of this year. It was also announced that John Leonard, who I think has been working with Stuart Friesen in the Craftsman Truck Series this year, will be the crew chief for Connor Daly this week and I believe the last couple races of 2024. It is unknown at this point if they're just crew chief for the remainder of this year or these will be the crew chiefs for 2025. What's really interesting, like I said, is that this was Brett Holmes' crew chief, that being Mike Shiplett. If you notice the entry list, Brett Holmes is not going to be running the last couple races of this year, it looks like, which Brett Holmes has shown some really good stuff throughout 2024. I believe he's been inside the top 20 or the top 21 in the standings this year. But unfortunately for him, he's just really kind of struggled at times as well. Mike Shiplett has a lot of veteran experience. He, of course, was a general manager or working as a higher up at RCR not too long ago in the NASCAR Xfinity Series and also has won a lot of races in the Xfinity Series with Cole Custer when Cole Custer, of course, drove back then first two rides racing in Xfinity in the mid-2010s. I think it's a big pickup for Matt Mills throughout the remainder of the year as they look to get better. And John Leonard has a lot of veteran experience 
working with team. Actually, I think he's been the crew chief for the number 42 team this year. And I got to say that he's done a solid job at times performing. So I think that we could see some really good stuff come from this. It's unknown how they'll do the rest of the year if Brett Holmes will show up. But I have to imagine that Brett Holmes, more than likely, will not be back this year and probably won't be returning in the 2024 season. Probably, though, will come back and probably try to run full-time in the 2025 campaign. And now we're going to head jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Ryan Truex. As it was announced on Monday early afternoon that Ryan Truex will drive the 26 for Sam Hunt Racing this weekend at home San Miami Speedway. Ryan Truex, the driver, currently does not have a ride at the moment for 2025. There was some speculation, at least for a little bit, before this announcement came out, that Ryan Truex maybe just maybe was going full-time with Sam Hunt Racing for 2025, but he at least is getting another start and opportunity. Ryan Truex has had a really good year so far in the NASCAR Xfinity Series, has scored two wins so far this year, that being a Dover and also one at Daytona in August. And I think that Ryan Truex could have a chance and opportunity to at least get a top 10 and maybe even a top 5. Ryan Truex is a guy who can get the best out of equipment. Like I said, though, he does not have any signed up at the moment for 2025. If I'm Sam Hunt Racing and somehow, some shape or form, Ryan Truex is not signed by that organization of Joe Gibbs Racing, you got to try to find a way to convince him to come over to your team if you can, though I could also see them going for rotation again next year with Corey Hine behind the wheel for select races as well. But I'm glad to say that Ryan is getting more starts and opportunities. Ryan is a guy that deserves more shots and opportunities at really good organizations. While Sam Hunt's not as strong as JGR, they've shown some stuff this year with Corey Heim. And I do believe that he has a lot of potential to really get the best out of equipment. So I think he's going to have a really solid chance and opportunity to be very fast this weekend. I think he has a good chance and a great opportunity for a top 10. And I do think the Sam Hunt Racing will show some really great pace and speed. It's a great opportunity for Ryan. I expect him to have some really good speed. And I think he'll have a really strong run with the number 2016 for sure this weekend. At home said, we'll see if he does get the chance to maybe run full time with this team in 2025. We'll have to wait and see what happens. And now we're going to head jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Las Vegas in the Circuit America TV ratings and the viewership. As it was reported by Adam Stern in regards to the viewership for this past weekend, that according to him, NBC got 2.3 million viewers for the NASCAR Cup Series race at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. You compare that to Formula One, where ABC got 1.3 million viewers for the United States Grand Prix at Circuit of the Americas. A lot of NASCAR fans we're celebrating because if you take a look at this, NASCAR is still king when it comes to the motorsports landscape. However, we're only up by 1 million viewers and having only 2.3 million people watching your event on network television is honestly not that good. I don't know what it was last year at this time. I'd have to imagine it was probably a little bit lower because Chase Elliott, of course, was not in the playoffs at that time. Obviously, drivers like Kyle Busch, Ross Chastain, Bubba Wallace, all those drivers were not in the round of eight, I believe, at that time. I believe Ross Chastain had been eliminated in the round of 12 at that time, if I'm not mistaken. But... Basically, having only 1 million difference shows that Formula 1 is still got a pretty big footload. And you also do have to remember that probably does come in with pre-race as well for Formula 1. And it also does come in with the fact that people are probably more interested because you have a lot of NASCAR fans who get tired of the playoff format and they might want to go watch Formula 1. But I will say the race of Las Vegas was definitely a lot better than the United States Grand Prix at Circuit of the Americas. I think got a, a much better racing package, and I think the fans definitely enjoyed a much better fuel mileage event than he saw in the USGP, where Charles Leclerc completely dominated. Again, it's the closest it's been in a long time, but obviously with Formula 1, NASCAR still has a foothold. If they could just find a way to continue growing NASCAR, I think they've got a good chance to continue overshadowing. I think there's a chance it could be around $3 million or something like that in the future at this event, but obviously you've got Talladega that will be in the round of 8 next year, which is going to be very interesting, and I think that's also kind of lining up to either whether I think it's Mexico or the USGP next year. So that'll be very interesting to see what people decide to watch when we do race. Nonetheless, kind of interesting for sure. I think it's comparing last year, which I think Holmes said last year was the weekend of the USGP. So we'll see how things kind of play out going forward. But I'm glad to see that it did be Formula Ones. I think NASCAR had, like I said, a much better racing product. But I think that there's also a little bit of concern the fact that the Formula One is still putting a little bit of a foothold and still growing at least a little bit. Very interesting stuff, nonetheless, for sure. And kind of makes me wonder a little bit what we're doing here. So I think it's a little concerning to see at least for NASCAR side, that only 2.3 million watch on network when it probably should be getting around 3 million for a healthy number 
to be perfectly honest with you. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the NASCAR and FRMM 2311 lawsuit. As it was reported by Matt Weaver earlier today that both parties have consented to redacting confidential info from both the 2016 and 2025 charter documents. For those who have been following the lawsuit very, very closely, what this means is that NASCAR and the teams have agreed to consent to basically not sharing certain information, where NASCAR won't share certain information and confidential stuff, where also the teams like 2311 Front Row that, of course, are part of this lawsuit, they will also share documents from 2016 or 2025, which obviously Front Row was around in 2016, but 2311, of course, did not come around till 2021. Obviously, there's been this lawsuit going on between both organizations there and NASCAR. And also, it's no secret that NASCAR does not want 2311 and Front Row to basically have their charters unless they do, of course, all of a sudden sign their charter agreement, which they did say the deadline was basically when all the other teams like RFK and Hendrick Motorsports and Joe Gibbs Racing and RCR and Trackhouse Racing, all those teams sign the agreement. Obviously, it's no secret that 23 Lime Racing and Farmer Motorsports are looking to expand going into 2025. Riley Hurts is currently the favorite to drive the third full-time seat. If they do expand to a three-car operation next year, but there's also a lot of rumors of some other stuff I've been hearing. So it's going to be interesting to see how things play out, but Riley Hurts is a current favorite to go there. And then, of course, you have Front Row Motorsports. The favorite for the Front Row seat currently at the moment is Zane Smith. Zane Smith, of course, had a working relationship with Front Row Motorsports back then, and it's all going to come down to what happens with the court day. Remember, the courthouse will be open on November 4th. And Judge Witters, I believe that's the name, will be the one. She will decide who gets the right. Will NAS- if NASCAR does get the injunction basically denied, basically 2311 and Front Row are going to run as open teams. If the judge grants the injunction, that means that 2311 and Front Row will be able to run as teams. The question I have is, will they still have three cars? Because NASCAR has to approve the charter purchase. That is going to be very interesting to see how it plays out. And I think that could be something to keep an eye out for as time progresses and goes on. NASCAR has their side of the fence, and they did provide some very good things to kind of counteract what 2311 and Front Row have. But, of course, Michael Jordan has a lot of influence on certain things as well, so he's probably going to have a lot of people on their side rooting for them as well. Again, it's going to be very interesting to see how things really play out between all these parties and organizations. This lawsuit is going to last for a very long time, probably not going to end until 2026, and it could definitely lead to a lot of major changes going forward into the not-so-distant future. And now we're going to hedge up onto the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Haley Deegan. Now, we've talked about Haley Deegan a lot on this channel over the course of the last week because it was announced last week that Haley Deegan will be leaving NASCAR and not returning in 2025 at all as she will be leaving NASCAR to transition over to any NXT starting in 2025. She'll run full-time with H&D Motorsports in the NXT and we're looking to try to win her first championship, though that is very unlikely currently at the moment. But she also this past week and actually yesterday she was on the Kenny Walls podcast or the Kenny Walls conversation. And Kenny Walls had asked her a question about how things went at AM Racing. And she also spoke on the struggles in NASCAR and working with AM Racing. Obviously, Haley Deegan, of course, left AM Racing at the middle portion of this season. She explained that she was very frustrated with how things were going over at AM Racing. She said she wanted to cry out of frustration and upsetness because the team just wasn't running very well and things were not going very well for her. Now, obviously, there was a lot of justified criticism that was sent out to Haley Deegan because of lack of performance, which I think is very fair. But to her defense, at least for the moment... AM Racing, since she left, has not gotten better. I thought they definitely would be a lot better when she left. And they have only scored two top tens since Haley Deegan departed the organization. Those came from Joey Logano. By the way, one of those races that Joey Logano got a top ten in, guess what? Joey Logano barely made it in to Watkins Glen. And basically got a top 10 because there was a lot of attrition near the end of the event, which sometimes you get lucky in those situations. But Joe Logano got a top 10, not based off of race winning speed or pace. So they haven't really done great. Josh Berry struggled in that car loss. Allen wasn't that great this year. And it does give me a little bit worriness for Harrison Burton going into 2025. 
Let's also go back to Thor Sport Racing. She drove course drove for Thor Sport Racing in 2023, and she struggled in 2023. Jake Garcia took over her ride for this year. I expected Jake Garcia to knock her out of the park. The only couple areas where Jake Garcia has done better is lap sled, where he's led 44 laps compared to Haley Deegan's two, and he also has a little bit of a better average finish. But he only has two top 10s, which, by the way, is the same amount of top 10s that Haley Deegan had in 2023. She also had a 21st place average finish, while Jake Garcia had a 19.2. You don't see people talking about that, though. And Thor Sport Racing has struggled immensely this year outside of Ty Majeski. Ben Rhodes got eliminated in the round of 10. Matt Crafton is a lot older now, missed the playoffs, and they just made a lot of shakeups that really have not made a lot of sense to make that organization a lot better. I don't think there's any denying that Haley Deegan struggled, but I think when it comes to the atmosphere that she was in, she needed to work with a team that was a lot more established. And unfortunately, AIM Racing was a newer organization that only had one year of experience. That's why I think Brett Moffat should have been her teammate. And there was talk of other drivers like Brett Moffat and Matt Benedetto being teammates going into 2024 to really help her out. If she had a better teammate working with her, I do think this team could have been a lot better because they also have been able to guide him. Look what Matt Benedetto's done for Viking Motorsports. He's made that organization a lot better and it's helped them grow. Had he gone to AM Racing potentially, I think it could have been a lot better for that organization. Haley still might be driving for the team, or maybe she would have been fired, but I think the organization would have definitely been in a little bit of a better place than they are currently at the moment. I just think there was a lot going against her, unfortunately. Ford did not really spend as much money helping their program out, and it definitely hurt their program this year. So while I think Haley Deegan definitely did struggle, let's also look at the team she was driving for and the organization, like I said, that she ended up driving for just really ended up struggling and not showing the promise they had. They really did struggle, and I think that's why Haley Deegan did not run so well in NASCAR at all. And now we're going to head jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about William Swalch. As it was announced yesterday afternoon that William Swalch will be joining Joe Gibbs Racing full-time in the NASCAR Xfinity Series in 2020 drive, driving the number 18 car for Joe Gibbs Racing. He'll have sponsorship from Starkey, and I believe that the current crew chief for the number 19 car, I believe, will be the crew chief for this organization, that being Seth Chafka. I think he will likely be the crew chief for this team in 2025. This is not shocking or surprising. It's been expected over the last couple of years that William Swatch, once he turned 18 years old, was going to end up going full-time. In fact, he will make his NASCAR Cine Series debut this weekend at home semi-Miami Speedway in the number 19 car and will run the final three races this year. Now, William Swatch is highly rated by a lot of people. If you look at a lot of people of NASCAR who work in the industry, they rate him very highly. And other drivers like Chase Elliott, I believe Bubba Pollard, have rated William Swatch very highly in the past. Now, William Swalch, there's no denying, has been super, super dominant in ARCA this year. He has won, I think, 16 or 17 ARCA races over the span of the last couple of years, which you should be doing if you're in ARCA, considering you're in the best equipment. You should absolutely be going out there and dominating. My big problem is, is that he has struggled in the Craftsman Truck Series this year. William Swalch has an average starting position, I believe, 11.9, and his average finish is like 19th or 19.5. And I don't think he's even scored a top 10 in the Craftsman Truck Series so far. Now, to be fair, outside of Taylor Gray and Corey Heim, it's been a little bit of a struggle for the organization, but still, it is something to keep note. I don't know the way William William Swalch is highly. And we also have to remember, too, when Connor Zilich drove against William Swalch in ARCA, Connor Zilich outperformed him like 5-1 to one or 5-2. to two. And one of the races that William got William outperformed Connor, he got in a crash at being Connor that had no fault of his own. In the other race, he finished second behind William. William just has been outperformed by Connor Zilich, and I expect that going into 2025. Realistically, I think William is going to have some struggles in 2025 and may not run as well. And this is the unfortunate thing with for Joe Gibbs Racing's Xfinity lineup for next year, most likely. You're going to have William Sawatch in the 18 car. You're going to have Brandon Jones most likely in the 19 car. Well, Brandon Jones was solid with Joe Gibbs Racing back many years ago. I don't know if Brandon Jones is going to come in here being championship threat. He was a round of eight contender two years ago, to be fair, and was very close to making it to the championship four. He did win a race in 2022, so I will give you that. But Brandon Jones is not the driver that's going to set the world on fire, and the only reason he's back over JGR is because he's bringing sponsorship and funding. 
And then you have Taylor Gray, who's driving the 54 car for Joe Gibbs Racing. Of course, Ty Gibbs will have ownership stake in that team, so Ty will be working pretty closely with Taylor Gray throughout the year. The lineup for JGR and Xfinity is going to be very, very weak. Now, they're going to have an all-star car, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit, but I just feel like this is the weakest Joe Gibbs Racing lineup since probably 2020 when they had Riley Herbst in the 18, Harris Burn in the 20, and Brandon Jones in the 19. Now, to their credit, Brandon Jones won three races that year, and Harrison got four wins. So they both panned out pretty solidly and ran well. I predict that William Swatch might win a race before the end of the year, but I do think there's some struggles. Now, if you look at the rookie class as a whole for next year, it's very stacked going into 2025. You're going to have William Swatch in the 19 or the 18. You're going to have Taylor Gray in the 54 car for JGR. You're going to have Connor Zillich driving the 88 car for Junior Motorsports, basically taking over, I believe, for Sammy Smith going or Sam Mayer going into next year. You have Carson Quaffles basically taking over the Brandon Jones car for next year, driving the number one car. You, of course, have Nick Sanchez joining Big Machine Racing, replacing Parker Klegerman. And then, of course, you have Daniel Dyer replacing Shane Van Gisberg and going into next year as SVG moves up the cup. And then, of course, you do have going into next year, Christian Eck is moving up, replacing AJ Allmendinger, who's moving back up to the NASCAR Cup Series in 2025. It's a very stacked rookie class. If you want my prediction, it's going to be Connor Zilch versus Carson Quavo for the rookie battle. I think those two are going to be the best. And then I think Taylor Gray, William Swatch, Nick Sanchez, and Christian are going to be bound for that third spot on the rookie field. But it's very stacked, and I think there's going to be a lot of rookie winners in 2025. So, though, there's two drivers that are not signed for next year, and that is Corey Heim and Ryan Truex. They should both be at Joe Gibbs Racing, in my opinion, in Xfinity. But unfortunately, because sponsorship funding matters so much in Xfinity, it's very unlikely that they're going to have rides for next year. And it's really, at least in Xfinity, at full-time. And it's very disappointing overall. But now we know that William Swatch, of course, is moving up full-time in 2025. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the first of three major stories in today's episode as we're talking about Budweiser number eight and Dale Jr. Now, I did a video talking about this on the channel earlier today, but it was announced early this morning after a lot of teasers on social media that Dale Jr. is racing the Budweiser number eight car for the first time since 2007. Later this year, I believe on November 23rd, at the Florence 400 in South Carolina for the South Carolina 400. It was also confirmed he will run other select races at the end of 2024 in this car and will also run select races in 2025 in the Advanced Auto Park Weekly Series next year. And I'd have to think this also will be a partnership in the Cars Late Model Tour as well in 2025. This is paint scheme looks absolutely phenomenal it's not absolutely perfect we know Dale Jr. of course is on his way to acquire the number eight trademark and obviously Teresa Earnhardt has let the number eight trademark exactly expire that's why Dale Jr. is getting this chance and opportunity if you're on social media on Monday evening you saw all the stuff going on you saw that Dale Jr. posted a cover photo of his 2004 Daytona 500 win. You then, of course, saw Tony Urie Jr. post a cover, and then he saw Dale Jr. showing an old commercial with the old Bud can, a 24-ounce can that Dale Jr. used to have many, many years ago. I think this is absolutely such an amazing partnership, and I w really would have to think that going forward, this could also lead into having some partnerships in some sort of capacity in NASCAR in 2025 i think that's something that could definitely happen going forward down the road right because dale jr obviously did say that he's planning not to run in the nascar city series in 2025 unless the right partner came along well guess why the right partner has come along budweiser which is one of the most iconic brands when you think of budweiser and dale jr it is iconicness. It's one of the most iconic schemes in NASCAR history. It's up there with the GM Goodwrench car that Dale Jr. had. It's up there with the Lowe's car that Jimmy Johnson had for many years. It's up there with other cars, Jeff Gordon's Rainbow Warriors DuPont scheme. It's up there with a lot of the legendary paint schemes that all these drivers had. And the Budweiser scheme is so iconic. And they've already released a merch line as well, which I believe maybe outside of Kyle Larson, this is probably going to be one of the biggest sales we see. 
I also would love to see something like this happen where Kyle Busch, of course, will be back in the number eight car in 2025 in the NASCAR Cup Series at RCR. I know they probably couldn't be able to change the font, but I would love to see Kyle Busch get the chance and opportunity for them to maybe change the number eight car so that can certainly be a possibility. You think about Dale Jr., the icon in this. I, I rooted for Dale Jr. somewhat. wasn't as much like Kirk Kirk. Chris, uh, Carl Edwards, Kurt Busch, all those guys, you know, Bubba Wallace, all those guys. But I rooted for Dale Jr. back in the day. And Dale Jr. was one of my favorite drivers. When he won that race in 2012 with the Amp, with basically the Mountain Dew sponsorship, it was really, really huge. But we've been waiting for the Budweiser car colors to come back for a very long time. So to see that the Budweiser colors are officially coming back in 2024 and also for the 2025 season, I think is absolutely phenomenal. This car looks amazing. It looks absolutely incredible, and I cannot wait to see this car officially on track. I think they should absolutely put it on TV. Personally, that would be really cool for them to do that. Maybe Fox or NBC or some sort of partner can find a way to televise the Florence 400 on TV. That would be something really cool for the fans to see, especially the Dale Jr. fans who probably won't be able to get out there because I believe that race at the Florence or will end up selling out very, very quickly. This is so awesome to see no done nonetheless and really great to see that the legendary Bud Weiser number 8 car is officially coming back in 2024 and also in 2025. And now we'll go ahead and jump on to the next major story in today's episode as we're talking about Frankie Muniz. As it was announced early this morning that Frankie Muniz will be full-time in NASCAR in 2025 as he'll drive the number 33 truck for the Raymond Brothers Racing in the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series in 2025. He will replace Lawless Allen, who will likely be potentially moving up to the NASCAR Xfinity Series, potentially in a second car for AIM Racing, but no confirmation on that at this point. This is going to be a really interesting opportunity. For Frankie, he'll be joining an organization that has kind of struggled a little bit. Now, this organization is probably going to get a little bit more support in the upcoming season. You go back to Frankie Muniz not too long ago in 2022, where 23, I should say, ran full-time in ARCA. And early in the year, he actually led the point standings after the first couple races of the year. He then unfortunately had a little bit of a decline at the second half of the year. He still ended up finishing fourth in the standings, and he did have a top five in quite a few top tens throughout the year with Red Jones Racing. Was very, very respectful. And so far this year, however, it has definitely been a little bit of a struggle. He's made two or three starts with Joey Gase Motorsports. There was rumors about him maybe taking an ownership stake in this organization, but that never really came to fruition throughout the year. And then he's made a couple starts for Raymond Brothers in Arca one or two times. And then, of course, he's driven for other races in the Craftsman Truck Series for this team and organization. I believe he's also driving for them this weekend at home semi-Miami Speedway. Now, looking at Raymond Brothers Racing, like I said, he's going to. This is an organization that I feel like he's going to end up struggling at just a little bit. I think Frankie does have some talent, and I think he really cares. And his passion for racing itself and his enthusiasm is absolutely incredible. And that's what makes a lot of people like myself a big fan of Frankie Muniz. The Malcolm in the Middle actor from Agent Cody Banks, from a lot of other really great movies that he was a part of. I'm just really worried that with him going to Raymond Brothers, he's going to end up struggling quite a little bit. Let's talk about Ray and Brothers for a second. Right now, 33 truck that Lost Allen has been driving for this year, that truck is currently third to last in the owner's point standing. So I will say there's been times where Lost Allen has shown some top 20 speed. I think getting some of that pointer, some Mike Skinner, has definitely helped him quite a bit. And then, of course, you have the other truck that's been driven by like Keith McGee and other people, and they have struggled massively this year. Rayum has looked to really take some major steps forward, but like I said, they really have struggled. And Frankie kind of talked about the struggles that he's had racing in NASCAR in 2024. And I'm very worried that going into 2025 that Frankie is going to struggle. And I think there's going to be a lot of weekends next year where Frankie Mias is probably going to be running really far in the pack. My best guess is he's probably only going to get maybe a few top 20s throughout the 2025 campaign. And a lot of the year, he's going to run outside of the top 20. And I'm really worried that is going to affect him throughout the year. And it's a shame that he has to go to a team like Rayu. The problem is the Ford camp, there's not a lot of really great drivers in the Ford camp currently at the moment. 
Jake R.C. has been a big disappointment with Thor Sports Unknown. He's going back there or not at this point. Lane Race has been one of the few standouts this year. He's gotten two Truck Series wins. And remember, he struggled early in this season. Really, the only other big standout has been Ty Majeski this year, who's in the Championship 4, has a good chance to make the Championship 4 in the Truck Series this year. Thor Sports had a big downturn in performance. Front row struggled early in the year. And I'm just a little worried that Ray Oom, which is a team that hasn't had that much success, is going to struggle. But I do think they will get a little bit more support from Ford going into 2025. If you want my prediction, like I said, for Frankie going into next year, I do think that Frankie will, like I said, get around two or three, maybe four or five top 20s throughout the year, but I think he'll be running around 25th to 30th most weeks. Now, hopefully they can improve on their qualifying stats. That's one thing that I could think could really help Frankie going into 2025. My other question I have is, could Frankie Muniz perhaps make some starts in, let's say, the NASCAR Xfinity Series next year? Maybe you go to a team like Red Jones Racing, and perhaps it really hasn't announced what they're doing at the moment for 2025. Could that certainly be a possibility? I wouldn't rule that out at this point. And there's other drivers that we don't know what they're doing currently at the moment. Why not have someone like him go and run some slack Xfinity starts for that team who showed a lot of promise with Noah Grayson this year and has had a couple top 10 so far throughout 2024. We know they're interested in going full-time currently at the moment, and they're probably going to make some other slack races in 2025 as well. It's going to be very interesting to see how things play out for Frankie Minas this upcoming season, but I think that Frankie will have a little bit of struggles, but I also think he could have a solid year. We'll see how he ends up doing with the Rain Brothers Racing Organization in 2025. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the final major story of today's episode as we're talking about Silly Season once again. Now, we already talked about the fact that William Sawash will be going full-time with Joe Gibbs Racing in 2025 in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. We already know, of course, that Sheldon Creed will not be back at Joe Gibbs Racing in the NASCAR Xfinity Series as, of course, he'll join Haas Factory Team and be teammates with Sam Mayer next year. But the other driver that's currently full-time at Joe Gibbs Racing right now is Chandler Smith. And there's been a lot of rumors and rumblings that have been going around in the last couple of weeks that Chandler Smith's future at Joe Gibbs Racing is very uncertain currently at the moment. Now, it certainly is a chance and possibility that Joe Gibbs Racing could run a fifth car, but that sounds like that's going to be very unlikely going into 2025. And it sounds like the fourth Joe Gibbs Racing car is probably going to be an all-star in rotation seat for 2025. Drivers like Martin Truex Jr., who's planning to run Rocky Ham in a few races next year. Ryan Truex, who makes select starts throughout the year this upcoming year. Probably going to see Bubba Wallace. Probably going to see Eric Amarola. Ty Gibbs, probably. Denny Hamlin one time. Chris Rebell will all probably make starts in that car at some point throughout the season. Maybe even Tanner Gray, considering his brother will be full-time in their Xfinity program. We might see Tanner get that chance as well. This means that there's a really strong chance and possibility that Chandler Smith will might not be back at Joe Gibbs Racing in 2025. Now, some people have mentioned a big reason why Chandler Smith may not be back at JGR next year is because of sponsorship. There's a lot of rumblings that are going around right now that unfortunately a lot of the sponsorship that Chandler Smith had had for him going into this year has left him in a lot of funding that he had for 2024 has sadly gone out the window for 2025. And if that's the case, that is certainly a shame. If he's truly out of Joe Gibbs Racing at the end of this year, that is definitely going to be a great shame. Chandler Smith, well, he's not won a lot of races. He's only won two races so far this year. The last 10 or 11 races in Xfinity have been exceptional. He has had 10 or 11 consecutive top 10s and has had a lot of top 5s in those top 10s in recent weeks. And if we actually went by the Winston Cup point standings, Chandler Smith would actually be the points leader. I believe he'd be near the top of the standings in the regular season standings as well. Chandler Smith's been one of the most consistent drivers in these playoffs so far and has a really good chance and opportunity to make the championship four in Xfinity this year. And I think if he makes the championship four with how fast he was at Phoenix earlier this year, and of course he won at Phoenix in the spring, I think he's got a really good chance to win considering Joe Gibbs Racing has had a lot of success. But he's not the only driver that might not be in a Joe Gibbs Racing seat full-time. 
Already mentioned this with the William Sawalich news. It sounds very likely that Ryan Trux won't be full-time in NASCAR next year, even though, in my opinion, Ryan Trux would be absolutely deserving to be full-time in 2025. Just they got to find sponsorship. And unfortunately, how the Xfinity Series and Trux Series works, for the most part, is they go after guys that bring a lot of funding and sponsorship to the table. And sadly, Ryan Truex doesn't have a lot of that funding, though I will say someone needs to find some funding for him so he can end up maybe being full-time in 2025. And then obviously, Corey Heim. Corey Heim, very similar to Chandler Smith, does not have a big budget going into next year, which is why Riley Hurst most likely is getting the third 23-11 seat for 2025. I do think, though, there's some other moves that are happening. There have been rumors that have been going around. Eric Eastab mentioned this on his channel. There have been rumors about maybe Corey Heim going to Legacy next year. That's been a wild rumor that's been going around as of recently. But I don't know if there's any truth of those rumors at this moment and at this time. But I do think Corey Heim will likely be back in the truck series next year. I don't know what happens to Chandler Smith if he doesn't go back to Joe Gibbs Racing in 2025. He could go to Sam Hunt Racing. Sam Hunt Racing has not announced anything currently at the moment for 2025. And that would be probably the best option if he wanted to stay in the Toyota camp. Or he could jump to another manufacturer like Ford perhaps. There are some Ford teams that haven't announced anything for 2025. Rec Jones Racing, like I mentioned a couple minutes ago, they are looking to trying to find a way to run a lot of races next year. That could certainly be an option for next year. His name has been linked to From Row Motorsports as well, but especially with the rumors of the charter lawsuit and all that stuff going on currently at the moment affecting it. Zane Smith is also still the fair for the front row seat, so I don't think that's going to be an option. Now, somehow Corey Heim doesn't end up going to Legacy. Maybe he goes to Legacy, perhaps. That could certainly be a possibility. Because originally, I think he was the favorite to take over the 19 car for JGR for 2025. But then all the SHR stuff started happening when that team kind of went up the fold at the end of the year. And Chase Briscoe became available, and they chose Chase Briscoe, which honestly is a pretty good choice. And I think Briscoe is a better driver than Chandler Smith. But it's a shame that one of the best Toyota prospects may not have a ride for 2025 at the moment because of stuff like this. Chandler Smith, in my opinion, should be full-time next year. He deserves to be full-time. He's shown a lot of potential, and he is a really talented race car driver. And it's such a shame to see that it's very likely, while not confirmed at this point, it is very likely at this moment that Chandler Smith is not going to have a ride at JGR. And if it truly ends up coming true that he will not be back at Joe Gibbs Racing next year, it's going to be a great shame, and it's going to be another fumble by JGR, in my opinion. You're going to have a team next year that is not going to be as strong. You're going to have William Swatch, Taylor Gray, and Brandon Jones. If I had to make my perfect Joe Gibbs racing lineup, Corey Heim, you would have Ryan Truex, and you also would have Chandler Smith in the team. That would be your strongest lineup you have in a long time. Unfortunately, their lineup is going to be a little less strong next year, and other organizations like Junior Motorsports that have stronger lineups are going to be better. Now, a theory I've seen people bring up is RFK. Maybe they open up a, third, a car in Xfinity. That could certainly be an option or rumors about that happening early this year, but I really don't know if that's going to happen at this point. But nonetheless, I really hope Chandler Smith gets the opportunity to run full-time with the team in 2025. But unfortunately, it's starting to become very lively and it's starting to sound like there's a really good chance and a strong possibility that right now at this moment, Chandler Smith may not have a ride going into 2025. And that's a shame if it truly ends up happening and he doesn't have a ride going into next year. So that is going to be today's NASCAR news and motorsports news episode. I want to thank guys for watching. Please subscribe to the channel. Notifications on so if I win a video, does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support on Patreon as well. Link description below that, and comment your thoughts below on today's episode. Do you think Chandler Smith will be back at JGR or not? Let me your thoughts in the comments below. And what are your thoughts about Frankie Mina's going full time in the Truck Series in 2025? And do you think he's going to struggle? Let me your thoughts in the comments below. Later today on the channel, we will, of course, have the Xfinity Series race picks for the contender Boats 300. If any major news breaks later today, we'll discuss here live on the channel as well. Tomorrow, we'll have race picks for the Straight Talk Wireless 400 and also the Pain Skin video as well. If any major news breaks throughout the rest of the week on the channel, we'll discuss it live here. So anyways, like I said, I want to thank guys for watching today's episode, and I'll see you guys next time for more great awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.